Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us for Research 411, a talk show focused on sharing best practices and trending research topics delivered by professional staff and prominent UT Dallas researchers from various disciplines. I am Tiffany Willoughby, Program Manager in the Office of Research and Innovation. I will moderate today's discussion. During today's talk show, Dr. Paul Fishwick, Dr. Rosanna Guadagno, Dr. Michael Kesden, Dr. Midori Kitagawa, and Dr. Mary Urquhart will engage with the audience regarding their multi-interdisciplinary research project, the Interactive Scaffolded Training Environment for Physics Programming, STEP, at this Research 411 talk show. Dr. Midori Kitagawa has a Bachelor's of Fine Arts in Painting from Joshibi University in Tokyo, Japan, a Master's of Arts in Computer Graphics and Animation from the Ohio State University and a PhD in Visualization Sciences from Texas A&M University. With her unique mixture of backgrounds in science, technology, and arts, she taught computer animation for over two decades and has worked a number of computer-aided educational projects with multidisciplinary teams. She is the primary investigator of the NSF-funded STEP project. Dr. Kitagawa, please tell us how STEP evolved. Thank you for the introduction. Um, STEP is a you know, scaffolded training environment for physics programming, and it is an environment designed by a multidisciplinary research team for students in introductory physics courses to learn physics concepts, modeling, and computational thinking in a synergistic manner and it is you know, supported by grant from NSF STEM plus computing program. There are you no know, many you know, physics simulation applications you know, students can use, but you know, students you know, tend to use you know, those simulation tools as a black box. Black box you know, students input to parameters and you know, see what's happened. You know, see, you know, simulation result and then they tend to not to pay attention to the process but you no know, with you no know, step students and the teacher build on you know, physics simulations based on the problems in their own curriculum using a modeling tool which is you not know, based on finite state machines or we co sometimes call you no know, state diagrams so students built on their own simulations, and we believe that you know, that helps you know, students learn physics concepts better. Step you know, learning modules are carefully scaffolded for novice learners. Um, we don't expect you no know, step user to have you know, any prior programming experience or knowledge. Also, you know, modules are multi-representational. Um, Multiple representation of a simulation are displayed you know, simultaneously. And the modules are grounded in research on teaching and learning of physics. We have built three step learning modules. Module 1 on 1D kinematics, module 2 on 2D kinematics, and module 3 on Newton's laws of motion. And we have, you know, field tested those modules at the you know, local high schools and UTD. STEP modules are a web application which is you know, ready to run in a web browser on a laptop or a desk desktop computer and the STEP user do not have to download any you know, special application besides you know, STEP itself. What Actually, you know, this is you know, our final semester and we are concluding this project in December. And uh, the NSF IS proposal we submitted uh, last December is uh, still pending. And if we get the grant, we're going to start the you know, next step project and we are planning to you know, build you know, more learning modules. And uh, our, our website is at the step with two P's at utdallas.edu. So no, please no, visit our website and no, try no, step modules. Thank you, Dr. Kitagawa. Dr. Paul Fishwick does research in modeling and simulation across all disciplines. 
His recent work has been to foster mathematical and computational thinking through arts and humanities contexts. He is CEO of Metaphors LLC in his work with the state of Florida on hurricane and flood simulation model auditing. He worked in industry at Newport News Shipbuilding and NASA Langley Research Center, both in Virginia. Dr. Fishwick, what cultural and language barriers did you have to overcome to make the interdisciplinary team successful? Well, thanks, Tiffany. Uh, yeah, I think uh, the idea of culture is, is maybe for, for a scientist or mathematician or an engineer, not something that first comes to mind. So one way of kind of looking at this, and I'll just say this before I get to the cartoon in front of you, is that um, this is a, it's a bit like being from a different country. Let's say France, England, Germany, uh, China, uh, United States. You have different customs, you have different vocabularies, different language, and this is definitely true in, 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 in our case as well as individual researchers. We have, uh, we actually just had a discussion. I won't get into it in detail, but it was about the word dimension, which in social science research has an established meaning, um, which happens to be different than the meaning in mathematics, which is also different than the meaning in physics. And, and so, you know, you, you basically, I'm not saying you have to walk around with a rule book, but you have to be kind of, or a code book, you know, a dictionary but you have to be willing to kind of engage, listen to the other side, and just be aware there are going to be cultural differences. So getting to the uh, cartoon in front of you, this might be considered, uh, you know, a simple representation of what appears to be a bunny rabbit eating a carrot in a landscape. And so this is kind of like the normal view of, the, let's say, the, the normal person. But how does, say, the artist look at this same scene of the bunny rabbit eating the uh, carrot on a landscape? Well, they may look at it like this. They may paint it or uh, through a creative product, render something a little different. That's a way of looking at the, at the scene. Um, it's a different way of looking at things. Uh, the physicist may take, uh, the physicist toolkit tends to be mathematics and uh and so they may have they have mathematical formulas and if you've you know if you studied physics you may recognize some of these but when they look at this you know the rabbit and the uh the carrot in the landscape they see different things if they have their if they're wearing their spectacles called physics um i'm a computer scientist by trade uh and you know when i look at things when i look at this scene I see all kinds of data structures and program structures. And when I say program, I mean like a computer program. Um, at the very bottom, there's something in, in logic, expressed in logic, which is a big deal in computer science. And so the point here is that uh, we all see the world differently. We should embrace that and pay attention to vocabulary. And uh, that's that's really important for all of us to do. And we've done a, a good job of that, I think, on this project. So anyway, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you, Dr. Fishwick. Rosanna Guadagno earned her PhD in social psychology at Arizona State University. She currently teaches at Stanford University. She was previously a professor at the University of Alabama and University of Texas at Dallas, a visiting professor at UC Berkeley, and a program director at the National Science Foundation. Her research examines social influence and persuasion, mediated communication, and gender roles. She is the author of the forthcoming book, Psychological Processes in Social Media, Why We Click. Dr. Guadagno, what qualities are essential for participating on an interdisciplinary research team? Thank you so much, Tiffany. Um, that's a great question. I think there are a number of traits that um, work well if you want to be part of an interdisciplinary team, but one of them is in particular willingness to be outside of your comfort zone, willingness to ask questions 
um, when you don't understand something and respect for your colleagues. Um, you know, it, it's it's becoming increasingly popular for interdisciplinary teams to collaborate together. Um, that also has funding implications um, as well. But there are just as 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 my colleagues mentioned, just as there are cultural differences across the globe and across different generations, there are cultural differences with uh, across disciplines. So as as um, Dr. Fisher just mentioned, there may be certain terms and jargon that I use in my field of social psychology that means something completely different to my colleagues. So in general, we've dealt with the discomfort, we've talked it out, we've been open, and there's been no ego. And um, over the course of the last three years, it's been amazing to see these this group of us from these very different disciplines both learn to communicate better with each other about our work, but also show a lot of respect, mutual respect for each other. It's so huge. And, um, and I'm really, really pleased and feel very fortunate that we've been part of a successful interdisciplinary team because they're important, but also not as common as one would hope. Thank you very much, Dr. Guadagno. Dr. Mary Urquhart is an associate professor and head of the Department of Science and Mathematics Education and affiliate associate professor of physics in the School of Natural Science, Sciences and Mathematics. She serves as director of the U Teach Dallas Secondary STEM Teacher Preparation Program, as well as the physics and space science content expert in the U T Dallas Master of Arts in Teaching Program in Science Education. By training a planetary scientist, her postdoctoral work was conducted at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory and NASA Ames Research Center with a focus on Mars exploration. During her 19 years at UT Dallas, she has been active in education and public outreach, including leading numerous grant supported projects in STEM teacher professional development and preparation. Dr. Urquhart, what personal and professional benefits come from working on research as part of an interdisciplinary team? Thank you so much, Tiffany. In, in academia, we tend to work in silos based on our own specific and often quite narrow areas of expertise. We also know that diversity is important in any organization. And for researchers, diversity of knowledge and ideas can lead to a flowering of inspiration and opportunity. So there are problems and projects such as STEP that absolutely require different disciplines to come together. And tackling some of the most important questions to society and to funders really depends on interdisciplinary work. Let's so just give a quick overview of, of some of the people involved. We really have a much larger team than the folks you're seeing today. And one reason why interdisciplinary work is so important here is because we're really looking at that interface between physics and computer science in the context of the classroom, and specifically computer science as it relates to computational thinking. So breaking down a problem so that it can be solved by either a human or a computer is an important part of that as is the idea of modeling, which is something, of course, that Dr. Fishwick is an expert in. So we have carefully scaffolded the levels and modules, and this is done because of our expertise on the team in modeling, in learning, in physics, as well as the ability to do the art and the computing and the psychology behind it all. And so just an example of how we can actually allow students to bring in their own word problems into step to solve them, just showing that it's it is all of the things that Dr. Kitagawa was talking about before. There we go. Just a quick example of the dynamic nature of step as a web based animation tool. I do not have the capability to program this, for example. So there are individuals on the team with different expertise and we don't really overlap in much of our expertise. So um, I just want to add on a personal note. Um, I absolutely love learning new things and the power of collaboration. I've greatly enjoyed being a member of this team. New ideas, new ways of thinking, those are personally invigorating to me. And I also appreciate the richness of discussions and the friendships that have come from working with this team and with other interdisciplinary teams on which I work. So I'm a better scientist, I'm a better educator because of what I learned from diverse colleagues, including these fine folks on the panel with me today. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Urquhart. I do have a question for you, but I will save it um, for a little bit later. 
And next up, we have Dr. Michael Kesden. Uh, Dr. Kesden is an associate professor of physics in the School of Natural Sciences and Mathematics. Although his PhD was in the field of cosmology, focusing on the cosmic microwave background and dark matter, his recent research focuses on stellar tidal disruption by supermassive black holes and the gravitational waves emitted by binary black holes. Dr. Kesden is also deeply interested in how technology can promote physics education and outreach and has developed step and vigor virtual interaction with gravitational waves to observe relativity. An interactive simulation of binary black holes and the gravitational waves they emit. Dr. Kesden's astrophysics and education research is supported by NSF and NASA NASA grants. Dr. Kesden, how did your team manage communication and coordination among your project sub teams? Thanks, Tiffany. Uh, I would like to second various comments that uh, it's been really great to be part of this interdisciplinary team. Uh, it's uh, you know the many different skills are required to pull off this uh, project successfully, and academics are traditionally uh, very siloed, and so no one person has all of those skills. And so one of the biggest challenges we faced in this project was coordinating and managing communication between the curriculum team uh, that Mary and I and Paul led that helped you know, develop the modules behind STEP, the technology team led by Maduri that helped implement that within the Unity game engine, and the assessment team led by uh, Rosanna that helped to you know, determine the effectiveness of STEP within the classroom. And so to help you know, coordinate these th three teams, uh, we, you know, two lessons we learned over the course of the project were really useful. One, uh, that we really needed to hire a project manager, you know, a student that could devote more time to the project than any individual busy PI could. Uh, and so the first uh, project manager we hired, uh, Jen Kochnar, um, who had a lot of background in industry, uh, helped share with us the second major lesson we learned, which was uh, using uh, design documents you know, coordinating each facet of the project. And so having designed documents for the art and for the technology, the, the science involved, the simulation, et cetera, uh, this allowed us, number one, that rather than just giving oral instructions in group meetings, we could have these codified documents that we could share that the vision, a unity of vision was maintained. And number two, over the course of a four year project, since we were mostly relying on undergraduate student and master's students, there was a lot of turnover. And so rather than reinventing the wheel, each time we introduced a new student, we could kind of seamlessly integrate them into the task of our work. And so uh, I'd recommend for anyone looking to get involved in interdisciplinary research, trying to uh, choosing a project manager and maintaining design documents would be uh, valuable steps to uh, successful implementation of the project. Thank you, Dr. Kesden. Alrighty, we do have a few questions for you. The first question that I have is directed to Dr. Kitagawa. What is interdisciplinary research and can you address the specific challenges you encountered during your work on the interdisciplinary project? Interdisciplinary research is sometimes called multidisciplinary or cross-disciplinary or transdisciplinary transdisciplinary research, but then uh, it you know, refers to a mode of you know, synergistic research by a team of you know, individuals that you know, integrate knowledge from multiple disciplines, like you know, we have done, to answer research questions that are beyond the scope of you know, just a you know, single discipline or area of research. And uh, the specific you know, challenges we encountered. Um, one of them is that you know, we have had a you know, big you know, research team. You know, besides you know, five of us, you know, PI and co-PIs, we had you know, uh, teachers, in-service teachers as you know, subject matter experts. And this semester, you know, since you know, this is our last semester, we have only three you know, research assistants working with us. But you know, for the most of the time in each semester, we had about you know, 10 students, 10 research assistants you know, working with us. So we were a big family. 
And um, we create you know, three subgroups, curriculum team, technology team, and assessment, assessment team. And you know, Mike mentioned them a little bit. And you know, we you know, worked on, so you know, each group, you know, each you know, sub team worked on uh, coming up with content for steps, implementing steps and uh, assessing the effective effectiveness of the step. But you know, none of us had you no know, time or you know, expertise to you know, micromanage each team. And uh, as you know, Mike mentioned, you know, hiring you know, project manager was a you know, big help. We wanted to have a you know, PhD student who work on uh, dissertation research related to step. And we thought you know, we could find such a you know, PhD students in computer science or ATEC, but you know, we didn't. And uh, we relied on master's students and you know, undergraduate students. And you know, we hired you know, master's students and undergraduate students as you know, research assistants. And uh, many of them you know, stay with us you know, for two years or more, but you know, Quite few of them had to leave the project because of they graduated or they got you know, internships. And you know, every time you know, someone was leaving, you know, we had to look for someone to replace the person who is leaving. And it was nerve wracking. And also you know, training you know, new research assistants, you know, getting up to speed was a you know, little bit you know, worked against the you know, productivity of you know, our project. It was a challenge for us. Thank you very much for the thorough explanation and answer to that question. Um, the next question that I have is directed to Dr. Guadagno. What advice would you have for teams wishing to form interdisciplinary research? Thanks, Tiffany. That's a great question. Um, first thing I'll say in, in, in my role as a National Science Program uh, Foundation Program Director, um, I will say that interdisciplinary teams and interdisciplinary research are highly fundable and highly sought after. Uh, in general, the more interesting research questions and the more interesting societal problems that we have to tackle are best approached with an interdisciplinary team because you have expertise from different fields to contribute different pieces of knowledge to it. In order to make that kind of team work, there needs to be some good rapport. Um, and, and one of the reasons why I actually um, personally chose to join this team and then selected to opted to stay with it, despite the fact that I moved on to another university, is that I actually had um, solid friendships with um, some of the members of this team. And so then it made it easier for us to merge as an interdisciplinary team. So first off, talk to your faculty friends, um, look for recommendations of colleagues uh, that they might know um, who might work well with you. Because so many collaborations, even within fields, um, fail over time just because of poor communication or ego that gets in the way. And in general, you have to go with an open attitude, a love for being, as I said earlier, outside your comfort zone, an interest in finding those high impact questions you can examine with an interdisciplinary team, and a willingness to, to um, ask and speak when you don't understand. And most impo importantly, I think a sense of humor because a lot of hiccups happen along the way. And it's important that you can work through the, the any disagreements and then laugh about them um, in the retrospect. So that would be my recommendation. Thank you very much, Dr. Guadagno. Another question that I have, and this can be for any one of the step panelists. Did you find that there was a need to modify the project based on any students' individual needs when you were piloting the program in those classrooms? Um, if anyone would like to take a stab at that question. Well, I'm the head of the assessment team, so I, I will speak up first since um, my role as the head of the assessment team was to basically design how we're collecting data to determine the effectiveness of, of, um, of STEP in the classroom. I think the biggest issue we really had with STEP was that our field study occurred during a global pandemic. And, and I think it was a very difficult time for students in general and then testing new software in the classroom on top of it um, made some students uh, feel a little bit more distressed. We actually found in some of our data analyses that that students who actually really liked using STEP actually 
it, it tended to enhance their their physics knowledge and their ability to think um, computationally or think like a computer programmer. Whereas the students who found step aversive, um, it, their their learning was actually reduced. So we did find some individual differences. Um, and and to any of the students that um, that had difficulties with step, I really wish we could apologize for any additional stress we added. But at the same time, gratitude for their willingness to help us um, test this software because overall it looks like it actually um, has been quite effective in the ways that we determined. And I see my colleague, uh, Dr. Urquhart, um, is raising her hand as well. Yes, I'd just like to follow up on that, that one of the things that we did in the spring with the university students was we added tutorial sessions. So we didn't really change the software in response. Instead, what we changed was the supports provided to the students to use the software to help make sure that they were more familiar with it and had their questions answered. And our second project manager is actually a graduate student from both physics and the Masters of Arts in Teaching program, um, a pre-service teacher at the time. He was phenomenal with that and had um, you teach Dallas students assisting as well. Absolutely. And actually, uh, Dr. Urquhart, if you could speak more to um, how you tackled that. So you had additional personnel coming in to support right, uh, with different learning mod modalities, correct? And, and did you have to maybe have any other additional challenges like language, for example, was the program only in English? Did you have any English as a second language students within the classroom trying to use the uh, product? Just tell me a little bit more about some of those challenges you may have encountered and how you address them. So yes, we haven't we haven't really dealt with the English as a second language with regard to the students themselves. The vocabulary that's taught in the classroom is it, for physics is English vocabulary. So that's mostly what you'll see mirrored in step. And the instructions that we have on the website, the tutorials are in video format. So that makes them a little bit more approachable. And when they run through YouTube, you can use the translate feature of YouTube to help with that particular aspect. Um, what we really had for the supports was, was again having that interaction and it was done through teams. It was done remotely because for the university, those large physics classes were all remote um, during the prior portion of the pandemic. Um, in the high schools, actually, we had a, a lot of challenges with the field test. The teachers were, were taking that on. It was the, the teachers who were dealing with the um, English as a second language or other challenges, but the main issues they had were honestly because of the pandemic as well. We did provide consent forms in both English and Spanish because we do know that we had students and parents who actually needed the consent forms in that other language. Thanks. Thank you for sharing that additional information. Um, I want to take a moment to address a few of the audience's questions because they too are important and coming in. Earlier in the program, possibly related to Dr. Kitagawa, um, we had a question pop in and that question is, what's your favorite program or technology to work with? Yeah, so no, we decided to no, use no, Unity because no, it offers a lot of flexibility. It's in a you know, cross platforms. You know, we can compile it for desktops. You know, and uh, you know, if we want to you know, you know, in the future, you know, we can you know, compile step for like uh, tablets and uh, iPhones. We haven't done it yet, but then it, you know, Unity is a you know, cross cross platform and also you no know, it's used by many schools you know, including high schools according to you no know, unity the company you know 10,000 schools over the all over the world are using you know, unity and also you no know, unity is you no know, free for academic use that's why you now we you know decided to use, use you know, unity as our platform Thank you, Dr. Kitagawa. Um, let's see here, another question from the audience. Can someone please tell us how UTD has supported your research and your project? Okay, so when uh, we received the grant, I was in the School of you know, ATEC, and you know, the project you know, resides in ATEC, and uh, uh, we have had a you know, lot of you know, staff support, you know, like accounting, you know, hiring, and uh, IT support from you know, School of ATEC. Thank you for sharing, Dr. Kitagawa. 
Another question from the audience. What's the hardest thing you've ever had to do for this line of work? Can I go ahead and address that? Getting back to what um, Paul was talking about earlier, I think it was really the communication piece that that was the hardest for a lot of us. We spent we spent whole meetings um, discussing the meaning of one word and how, for example, states and how it applied in the context of STEP. And it was a challenge, but I think it was a, a fruitful one for us to work through, and and we successfully navigated it. Thank you, Dr. Urquhart. And I'll just add to that. Um, I remember another meeting where we spent had this lengthy discussion of what um, the word model means across our respective fields. And it was fascinating because like I learned all these new definitions of modeling that don't have bear any resemblance to the way I, I define it in my own field. But um, but again, that sense of humor kicked in and these all became good bonding experiences for the team. Thank you for sharing Dr. Guadagno. All right, another question from the audience. What is a good example of a similar project at another university? I will be happy to take that one because I think we drew a lot of inspiration from FET, FET.colorado.edu. We are complementary to FET. We are certainly not a rival. Um, it, we're not competition and that wasn't our intent. Um, but the the idea of using this educational technology to teach physics through an online interface is really inspiring and led to much of what we have with STEP. Thank you for sharing. Could this be adapted to kindergarten through 12? So I'll be, be happy to answer that. And um, this is meant for introductory physics, no matter what level that introductory physics is at. But I would say that means really middle school would be the lowest I would go with steps specifically, um, or potentially some um, very motivated or gifted and talented upper elementary school students. But in terms of its classroom teaching context, I wouldn't use it typically before about sixth grade. And then just a justification for that reasoning. And, and I think that has to do with the, the complexity of the modeling that's going on. And it really has to do with the curriculum that's expected with regard to the standards um, for different grade levels. And that's true in both Texas and elsewhere in the United States. Thank you, Dr. Urquhart. And all of our panelists, thank you very much for sharing your time, talent, and resources with the attendees and the UT Dallas community at large. For additional information and to learn more about other Office of Research and Innovation programs, please visit research.utdallas.edu. Thank you and have a nice afternoon.